Welcome to the Buker and Friends podcast, co-starring 10-year NBA center Ryan Hollins. Couple pump fakes, leads it, shot blocked by Ryan Hollins. Hollins sent that into the third row. Six rebounds and eight assists. Oh! Hollins climbs the stairs. Down the floor. Ryan oh! Hollins, he is the high jumper. That's what I want to see. Give me some gunpowder and throw the hammer down. And now, here is your host. Let's send it over to Rick Buker. Rick Buker. Welcome to another episode of Buker and Holland, subsidiary of Buker and Friends, part of the United Wecast Network. I'm Rick Buker. You can see me on FS1. You can read me on Bleacher Report. You can follow me on Twitter at Rick Buker. He is. Ryan Hollins. You can follow him on Twitter at the Ryan Hollins. You can see him on ESPN as well as, oh, I don't know, Clippers broadcasts, TNT, NBA TV, you name it. You can see him. And you can follow him on Instagram at Ryan Hollins. And we are joined by a guest, a surprise guest, <laughs> uh, a colleague of Ryan's, Ali Clifton. Clifton. <laughs> Calling us from the limo after the Clippers upset of the Golden State Warriors. And you guys, call the, now explain this. You guys called the game via virtual reality. So where were you actually sitting? Were you actually even at the game or or was it just a, you were virtually at the game? That's actually a really fair question because we were at the game, but not really at the game because we were sitting in the truck outside of Oracle Arena. And so we sit there in a booth and we we actually call the game for which people who are at home with goggles on. Oh, okay. They're watching it from this 360 experience. And so we kind of just give them that up close look. So you guys aren't actually, see, I pictured you guys wearing the goggles or like the headsets and calling the game, but you weren't doing that. You were just doing it for the people who were wearing the goggles. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. <laughs> So now, so if they have a 360 view of the game, what do you guys have in the truck? We see both. Like there's a camera face in each court. And so we don't have to do the flip. Like the people with the headset, they kind of automatically flip once you pass half court. And then there's a, a, a camera right in the middle where the players go and check in at. But we can see both feeds, uh, essentially. And they call that like there's a feed for the left eye and then there's a feed for the right eye. And so when you're watching it at home, if there's something that's happening at the bottom of your screen, we can tell you as a viewer to look left. Got it. You know, or from a fan angle, when a fan, for instance, in tonight's game was bringing a beer up to his seat. Yeah. He hands the beer out and you kind of lose track of where that beer goes. And it makes you feel like he's actually handing you a beer. Like that's how close some of these camera angles are. Wow. That could be a little freaky. It, it is kind of like tonight. Steph Curry was going to check in the game and had his towel on his head. Yeah. And he threw his towel over the camera that's at the center court angle. <laughs> And you like flinch, right? You like, like you duck. Ryan did. <laughs> yeah, I did. I flinched. You got, you got me. Allie was stone faced. She was Patrick Beverly. I was, I was flinching. Hey, I'll there you go. Beverly any day. <laughs> she was Kobe Bryant, and you were Matt Barnes, or oh. something like that. On yeah, the ball yeah I was Matt Barnes. I'll take that. There you go. Uh, so now, how many people are you doing this for? Like, what's your audience? I think there was like, like at least. Seven, eight million. Well, I, you know, I think we blew <laughs> I thought it you were gonna out. Say, I tonight. thought you were going to stop there. I think there was at least seven or eight people that were <laughs> seven or eight million people. Virtual. Wow. I mean, yeah, man. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, we outrated Fox, TNT, you know, whoever covered the game, the NBA finals. You know, okay, this, you're was, being, this okay, was the you're place being to be. Now. Okay, I, I mean, you. Ryan was okay. talking about how he was gaining thousands of followers on social media by the minute. Is Burn that right? it up. Burn so, it. So you're up to 4,000, but now is that? <laughs> All right. So what's the experience like for you guys to see the game? Because all of us have done broadcast. All of us have done live broadcast. All of us have watched from studios. And I've gone, I've gone into the truck when I've done sideline. I've gone into the truck before games. What's it like for you to call a game from the truck? That's a truly unique experience. 
honestly, I, me personally, I feel like you get better angles, even though we didn't have the greatest kind of setup today. Yeah. But I, I get this kind of like, you know, when you're kind of singing in the shower to yourself, like <laughs> nobody can see you. You kind of don't give a darn about anything. Like, yeah, like who's listening to me? Like, right. You get that feel where. I feel like when you call a game in person in the arena, you're you're a little, you know, you're cognitive of what's going on around. Sure. <laughs> I, I just think at the end of the day, the the vibe and the environment that it allows you to be in is kind of like what we're doing right now. It's such yeah. a podcast feel mm. because at the end of the day, as a broadcaster, you know, on the linear networks, we we have such. I don't, I don't want to say like rules and guidelines, but there's a certain structure and format to the show, right? You know, your play-by-play has his role, your analyst has their role, and your sideline has their role. We're here. We're supposed to act as if the viewer at home with their goggles on are sitting right in between us, and we're just watching a game. Interesting. You know, we're having a drink together or mm-hmm. whatnot, and so it's more chill, laid back. It's not as much, you know, direct play-by-play um, kind of calls or emotions. It's just kind of like, Read and react. It's not yeah. kind of like a player. You know, we, like those are the moments. Like tonight, Ryan would lose his composure, and rightfully so, for a lot of Clipper moments. But like that's what you want your viewer to feel, that excitement. Right. From sitting at home on their couch. We actually did this at Bleacher Report from a couch. Almost the same thing. We did it video-wise. It's very, very similar deal. And mm-hmm. I want to say we actually did it with an NBA 2K game and called it like it was a live game from the couch, just sitting there, and you weren't calling it as as a typical broadcast. You were just making comments about whatever, and probably an experimental stage of of what you guys uh, did tonight. But you mentioned that uh, there was plenty to get excited about for Clippers fans. The Clippers winning one twenty nine, one twenty one. Aren't too many people that saw this coming. In the big picture, what does this result? say to you guys about about the Warriors let's be let's be specific about that because they're the team that's the defending champions they're the team that's supposed to be going on they're the team that was supposed to wrap this up at Oracle tonight and now they've lost two in a row at Oracle so Ali brought up a big point uh, before the game Clay Thompson um, (laughs) Clay I'm I'm starting to wonder about Clay's personality man Clay's a wild man (laughs) he is a, a wild dude and he kind of makes these comments, Rick, I don't know if you caught it, where he says, uh, you know, they're looking forward to the, you know, closing out. And, right. you know, the second round, you got to handle your business and, you know, don't play around. And the reporter, that's the bait, because as a player, you don't answer that. We know that internally, but he answered it. And it was it was a bit of just a, just a hesitation, just a little bit of a look away. And you got the Clippers playing with their lives on the line. Yeah, you got a team, I think, too, at the end of the day that has proven that. No one in this league is unbeatable. Yeah. And I think that's what's been so impressive. And I think to your point, Rick, when you say it, they didn't just beat the Warriors twice in this series. They beat them both times on their home floor. We talked about it. That is one of the toughest places to play, let alone win. Right. And you've done it in the postseason against a, a healthy minus DeMarcus Cousins, but a, a team that has won a championship with the, the group that is right now out there on the floor. You have, you know, you look at the numbers, you have, KD going for 45, 20 mm-hmm. plus from Clay, 20 plus from Steph, and you tell me that you don't win that game? Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, is that they've not only lost two games to the Clippers, and they've not only lost two games at Oracle Arena, but they've lost giving up 135 and 129 points. And this, to me, is the, as Brian will tell you, is something that I've been harping on since the beginning of the year. And I just, I felt, I felt as if I'm on an island. In fact, I made a joke about it. I was on FS1's Lock It In. And the joke did, the joke fell because uh, we were talking about the Warriors. And I was doing a a back and forth with Clay uh, Travis about the Warriors. And the question was, whatever the, the bet was in terms of the Warriors winning the championship. And the question to me was, are you confident that the Warriors are still going to win win it all this year? And I said no, and I'm actually surprised because I knew Clay was going to agree that he doesn't have any confidence in me either. I said, look, I've been I've been driving this bus by myself all year, 
and I look back and there's nobody on the bus and suddenly I look back and there's not a, every seat's taken. Like, wh- when did everybody jump on and suddenly get uh, have questions about, about the Golden State Warriors? And yet, I feel as if just... And it's weird because the playoffs just started and yet I feel like there are more people questioning whether the Warriors can do it again this year now than they ever have before. And I don't know where you... where where you are on that, Allie. I don't know where you were before or where you are now, but I'd like to know. Here's the thing is that I, I think that the Warriors are the team to beat themselves. Because when they are all clicking, yeah. when they're clicking on all cylinders, I, I wholeheartedly believe, and I think there's a lot of people that would agree, that they're unbeatable. When they are clicking, they are locked in. It's from a mental standpoint. It's from a physical standpoint. They are going to be tough to beat in a seven-game series. They will be the ones that beat themselves if they ultimately do not three-peat. But in that same right, three-peat is not easy to do. That's not winning one title. That's not winning two. That's a lot of things going right for three straight years. Yeah. Not to mention, from the outside looking in, if there is going to be a team, if there's going to be players, franchises that believe in the ability to withstand and, and keep them from winning that third straight title, you have to see that they can be beat. And in the first round, the Clippers are proving that that squad can be beat. Ryan, I know you bleed blue and red, so it's not a completely oh, wow, objective wow. it's not a completely objective viewpoint, but what at this point with the series, the Warriors leading 3-2 going back to LA, what are your feelings about the Warriors in the big picture? I don't think this is as much about the Warriors as it is the Clippers. Um, See, Ali, I told you. I told you he was bleeding blue and red. Oh, God, this is the truth, though. Well, there's one one element that I kept screaming out, and you were wrong on this. You said DeMarcus Cousins wasn't playing well. He He made him worse. He wasn't. Well, even though he wasn't playing well, he enforces the middle of the paint. And whether he comes in for five minutes, ten or fifteen, yeah, he the Warriors aren't getting punked, and they got their lunches ate in the paint tonight. And it wasn't necessarily from outside, as Ali brought up a good point. Lou Williams knocks down one three pointer, and it was the biggest shot of the game, right? But he didn't kill them from outside. It was the paint. Montrez Harold, Danilo was, Gallinari. I mean, there was play after play. Agreed. Um, Gallinari, yeah, Danilo was eating in the paint, so. That's the where you rely on Damian James. You rely on Demarcus Cousins. Now Andrew Bogut is, is literally out there on an island, and a guy who's you know aged a bit uh, mm. is, is really tough to guard in in in, uh, in pick and roll scenarios and just guarding the paint. And he's the lone ranger in there uh, at, at the center position. And this Clipper squad is a squad that can play small, and they will dominate the paint opportunistically. And if, if we got to be honest. It was a perfect game from the Clippers. Everything had to go right, and tonight everything did go right, and it was still a slim margin of victory, Rick. See, it, and you and I talked about this in a podcast last week, and I asked you, if you recall, I asked you, give me a big man's assessment of Andrew Bogut, and you said that he was rim-protecting. You thought he was active. And I didn't say anything because the reason I asked, uh, one, was because I wanted your viewpoint of it but I also asked because I felt like while he did protect the rim that the Clippers were not intimidated by him they were not afraid to attack the rim they were not afraid to go at him and let I me thought, elaborate let me not as your starting center now that's the game changer you feel me like you might as well start Looney and bring him off, hmm. and that may be a better matchup for you because the, the, the Clippers now start small with your Michael Green. And I'm not trying to help out Steve Kerr, but now you've got to actually respect the Clippers and make an adjustment. Because you remember earlier in the series, Kerr was quoted on saying, we, we just have to be us, and we weren't the best us. No, but you got to match up with the Clippers now, and you, you've got to take a deeper dive into this coaching. Yeah. Big picture for me, this is the shift. Because anytime I would talk about the Warriors being this vulnerable. A this is a kid-friendly uh, podcast. Rick, what'd you say? Oh, goodness. Watch your mouth. What do you What do you think I said? Rick, Rick he said shift, by the way. This oh. is the shift. Oh. Oh, I, this thought is you the were, shift. I thought you were kidding. Yeah. It's the shift. What? You said it was the shift. <laughs> 
<laughs> Rick, welcome to my night. This was me the entire night in the booth with this guy. He kept calling himself KD. Then he was Lou Williams. Oh, I mean, oh no, Al, Ali, 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 welcome to my world. Okay, <laughs> you he rented him tonight. I live with this on a weekly basis. <laughs> yeah, he said shift. Right? But here, here is the <laughs> here is the shift. It's that when I, when I would talk shift? to people and I would express my my belief that the warriors were leaking oil and were vulnerable, they would say, yeah, but I still can't see somebody beating them four times in a row in a series. And and I'd have to nod and I'd say, yeah, it, that's hard. That's still hard to like envision a team or see or pick the team that's capable of of doing that. And I've always said it's going to be by attrition. Teams are going to take pieces off of them and then whoever's at waiting at the end of the line is going to get a battered Warriors team and that's going to be that's going to open the door. But now for the first time I think it raises the question and maybe this is why people are getting on the on on my on my bus. It's that you're wondering can they summon the energy and the focus to win? four times in four series if that makes sense like they can the they do the can they get those I mean, 16 I, wins can they put it together enough to win 16 times i think they have i would say that they have what it takes but you're right do they want to do it yeah i think yeah. you look at this series and you ask that's a fair question you have to ask yourself that because it's Honestly, I'm I'm not sure it's it's want. I think they want to. I I just wonder whether they can summon the mental and physical energy but for as long that, as it Rick, takes. That's a choice. Like whether or not you mentally want to be locked in, understanding and knowing what these two and a half months at the end of this season, knowing that you have a chance to three feet do something that has rarely been done in the history of the game. Yeah. Like that that's there's still a choice there. Yeah, but I also take I take into consideration there's a reason that no one's ever done it. There's a reason and and hasn't done it in decades in this day right. and age. And Ryan ta- Ryan and I talk about this a lot and I wonder Ryan how you apply this thought to it. The fact that the game is so much more athletic. It's so much more physically taxing and Ryan has said it. I talked to Dante Jones the other day about kind of the wrestling match that the game used to be. And they've said, no, the game today is much more physically taxing because there's so many more possessions. You're, you're, you're flying up and down the court at such a faster speed that the grind of this game is much greater. And so... That's where I just question, especially when you get it to Marcus Cousins, and he was the he was the piece that you added. I mean, other than that, you're basically riding with the same horses. And now that you've taken Demarcus Cousins out of the out of the equation, you're riding with a with a bench that simply is not what it's been in the past, which only puts more pressure on your on your main guys to be able to not only carry the weight but to build a cushion for that bench that's not going to be able to add anything to it. Well, this is this is where I don't count out the Warriors. They have possibly, I mean, you, you, whatever list you want to put it on, where you want to stop the number at, four of the greatest competitors in the NBA yeah, and just guys that have come out and compete and guys that kind of like find a way. Um, it's, it's darn near literally impossible for the Warriors to have not overlooked this game. And they did. They took their foot off the pedal. Mm. You know, Kevin Durant felt like he proved what he needed to prove. And when a team was motivated, you saw what they were able to do against the Clippers. Now, I do like the matchups, and I'm still going to scream that from the mountaintops that the Clippers have. But it is tough to go against the, you know, defending champs just because they've been there before. Game seven's on the road against Houston. And what this team can do is they hunger down defensively. So uh, it, it, it's just an interesting thing. And I think a real story in this is the road team. Rick, having played in the playoffs, when you're on the road, there's no text messages. There's no phone calls. You're away from the friends, the family, the kids, whoever's whoever's texting you and getting people tickets and, and driving in. And you got 100 people at your house. And 
all this stuff, and your 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 mom flies in for the game and flies back. It's just you and the team on the road, mm. and the Warriors have played better. And right now, we can look at it and say the Clippers have played better, and 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 a lot of those distractions are headaches. I mean, if you look at the Clippers squad after they they play the game, you know Pat Beverly's popping up on Sports Center, people's podcast, Landry Shamit's going on the jump. I, I, I mean, it was they were all over the place. It, right. it, it, it's stressful. Pat Beverly's sitting in a a locker room. After a 31 point comeback, eating nachos. Like, how chill and relaxed. Lou, Lou. Or, yeah, I'm sorry, Lou Williams. How chill and relaxed do you have to be <laughs> when you just knocked off the defending champs? Well, right? if he was I really mean, chill, if he was really tough. chill, he would be eating those nachos right before uh, the game. If he was really <laughs> chill. You have a point. <laughs> no, but that, that, is, that is a fair point. So. I have to ask this of, of, of you guys because of that very thing. And this has been bugging me, maybe in part because I expected the Nets Sixers game to be competitive. I expected the Nets to show up. And in fact, I expected them to win, to be honest with you. And not only did they not win, but this is what I'm trying to come up with an explanation for. And I have one, but I want to hear from you guys first. The Nets down 3-1 on the road to a higher seed, you would think you just play loose. You play like the Clippers play tonight. Uh, you play like the Jazz play against the Rockets. Like just, you may not win uh, the, uh, Oklahoma City. Like name, name almost any other team. Back against the wall, on the road, you're the lower seed. You just let it fly. The Nets played like they were the team closing out. They, I've never seen a team, an underdog, look so tentative about every single thing that they did. So help me out here. When you guys watched that game, what was your takeaway? Well, with the, Explain with the to Nets, me why the Nets the played Nets. the way they did. Because don't tell me it was the Sixers. It wasn't the Sixers. The Nets did it to themselves. Uh, well... I don't know. I, I think Ed Davis's ankles have to be falling off because it has to be more than an ankle injury. Uh, he was the key factor in that game one. Uh, why? Because he's a walking double double, and he's tough enough yeah. to play at a, a playoff level, and he, he's able to switch out and guard larger or smaller defenders, and he, he just made plays. And Jared Allen was actually benched. Jared Allen's just not ready. The way that the Nets play, they funnel everything into the big man, mm -hmm. and offensively, he's an he's a dynamic rim roller, and he he just he he could not play to par in this series. He he wasn't he wasn't there. And if you notice in game one, he was benched. They went small. There's a reason Dudley was playing the five, yeah, because the kid had an excellent season. But they just the the Nets, you know, similar to the Clippers. I don't want to say similar to the Clippers. The Clippers have a far better team. Um, they really didn't expect to be in this situation, Rick. Right. Otherwise, they would have went out and loaded up at the trade deadline or even in, in the buyout market. You know, my thought, too, uh, one of my favorite stories and moments when I covered the Cavs during that finals run, especially the year that they won it, when you talk of a 3-1 t a team down 3-1 playing on the road, it, it crossed my mind tonight in particular with the Clippers from the standpoint of Ty Lu prior to game five, which was the last at the time before this game started, the last time the Warriors had lost a game five in the Steve Kerr era. Mm -hmm. Ty said, we have to get on a plane and come back anyway, so why not play a game six? Right. You know, hmm. why just go there and get our butts kicked? We have to get on this flight anyways. Right. A and so when I was looking at this game tonight, I, I actually said to Ryan, the way the Clippers were playing is how the, the Golden State Warriors needed to play given what it takes to close out a series. Yeah. In general. And then I think about it from a net standpoint. I wondered, actually, the way that game was going, how much those ejections actually took part on the mental psyche of a young Brooklyn squad who was who was playing so well in the way that game four went to not right. come up with a win. How I, much that took a toll on them mentally. I actually I, I agree with you. A lot of people looked at it on paper and said, Jared Dudley for Jimmy Butler that's a trade that the that the Nets would make uh, anytime. And mm -hmm. I, maybe on paper, but the intangibles that Jared Dudley brings and the uh, the enmity. Those guys, that, th that role, every locker room needs a guy like that. Yeah, yeah. And well, emotionally, 
those guys didn't know how to meet what Jared Dudley was doing. Mm. And you know what, Rick, I'll just throw this out. We need to re-release that pod with you and Dudley. I know those are some gems. He's probably the, the hottest guy on the internet right now. Yeah. Um, so we'll have, we'll, we'll do that probably later on, but, um, they, they didn't meet the call and it, and it's a learning experience, um, for those guys, but the veterans played well. And we talked about now, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to the center position, um, you know, just missing and Jared Allen not really being ready and those guys not knowing. And a lot of what Brooklyn does is they break you down one on one. They're they're yes. relentless getting downhill. Yep. And Philly just scrapped in and said, "Man, we're going to play one on one defense. You yeah. know, we're not getting embarrassed." No, it's a good point. And from an X's and O's point, you're you're absolutely right. They missed Ed Davis terribly. Jared Allen couldn't do anything with Joel Embiid, and sh- slowly but surely, Philadelphia just imposed their physical will on on the Nets and and took advantage of their size. But I believe there was one other psychological thing that changed that that I didn't anticipate and now on reflection should have, which is the entire year, the Nets were the feel-good story. They were the good guy. They were the team you rooted for. They were the, the little legend that could. They And then Jared, actually what he said was true, but... In the playoffs, even the truth will come off as trash talk. They suddenly became trash talkers. They suddenly well, Jared, became... Well, Jared, Jared wants to make it about him to let D'Angelo Russell and those guys be free. You know what I'm saying? And they didn't understand, yo, go rock out right now. And I, that's, what Pat, that's what Pat Bev does for the other guys. In, in game two, Pat Bev said, I'll take the heat. I'll fight with KD. I'll do this. Actually, in game one, he set the tone. And then the Clippers follow suit. Everybody else is free. But he's doing that for veteran guys. This was a young group. I mean, nobody looked more rattled and out of it in game five than D'Angelo Russell. He was a half a step slow on everything. I mean, when you're getting your jump shot, when you're getting your three-point shot attempt blocked, there's something, there's something that's not right. And he just, he looked like he was in a daze. And I, and I think you're right. I think that I, what Jared was trying to do was to deflect the energy toward him. But you know what it did is it pissed off the Philadelphia 76ers in terms of, wait a minute, this guy off the bench is, he's talking stuff to our main guys. He's, he's, he's in the wrestling match. Like he's in the middle of it. Like, no, no, no. Well, no. nobody. Okay, I'll, I'll sum this up, and we're we're getting ready to get out right now. As a matter of fact, I would just say Philadelphia came closer, and the Nets kind of went away. They splintered, and Jared Allen and those guys. Yes. I didn't see all five go five guys of the Nets having Jared Dudley's back, yep. and Philly. They man, they shoved Jared Dudley into the sidelines, bro. Yep, I would agree. So I guess yeah, the 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 limo ride is over, which means the podcast is over. <laughs> oh, shoot. So you can explain. How about how about that? So that does it for this episode of Buker Hollins and Clifton, the first ever ever episode of Buker Hollins and Clifton. Clifton. Thank you. It doesn't sound. I don't know. It doesn't sound like a law firm. It sounds like an ice cream shop, to be honest. Hey, I'm good with ice cream. I am. I am very good with ice cream. I'm a hundred. I'm in there with you. <laughs> Soft serve, especially. All right. I was going to say, with sprinkles and a cherry, please. Amen to that. <laughs> Maybe even a little Heath Bar Crunch on there. All right. Ooh. That does it for this episode. Uh, don't forget, wherever you get your podcasts, rate us. Give us a review. iTunes or wherever. And then if you want us to do something for you, screenshot that review, the stars. Simply screenshot it. Send it to at Buker Friends. And you will be eligible to win some uh, some prizes, a swag bag at the moment that is a Game of Zones swag bag. Who wasn't want that? Joel Embiid, Game of Zones, you can't beat it. All right. For Allie, for Ryan, for myself, as always, we'll have another podcast for you tomorrow. I don't think Allie's going to be with us, but Ryan and I will chop up the rest of the playoffs, get to that Boston-Milwaukee series that's about to start. In the meantime, as always, thanks for listening.